Hello everyone, welcome to the FPL Wire. This is Pras and this is my first solo video for The Wire. Um, nervous but excited because excited because um, it's my favorite topic, it's fixtures. So um, what we thought is we'll talk about wildcard windows as the theme, but in usual style that I typically like to present. First, we'll do a little bit of a big picture helicopter view of the first eight game weeks we look at even bigger picture and look at the first 19 game weeks, which is the wildcard window, and what are the, some of the things that are standing out. Then I'm going to recommend six different wildcard windows. Some are more appealing than others, but I think for the sake of completeness, these were the six that sort of stood out in the first 19 game weeks till when we can play the wildcard. So that's what I'll talk about and hopefully this is interesting and uh, if it is I, I do urge people to subscribe so that's your your pledge to me if you if you like this video and you're not subscribed please do so we're looking to reach 30,000 sub sub subscribers by hopefully game week one so uh, we'll see how close to it we get to so let's get into uh, the first eight game week so what is it that is sort of standing out um, to me um, as, as the fixtures are coming in. Well, the first one is game week one, which is Man City's game is on Friday. So that is already something to think about because uh, X server crash will be high because it will be the deadline. Everybody will be locking their teams. They have unlimited transfers. News will filter through, um, you know, certain players playing or not. So that's the first thing that it sort of stood out in game week one. Man City plays first. Um, then actually, um, in the midweek between game week one and game week two, they play the Super Cup. So while we were hoping that Man City, we will get some nice midweek rests and we can sort of predict the minutes for players better. Uh, we're not going to get it this season because Sevilla, uh, they play in the Super Cup between game week one and game week two. The match is in Greece. So there is a little bit of a travel involved. But on the plus side, because they play on a Friday, which is game week one, and then game week two is basically the next weekend, there is some time. So it's not like, you know, they're completely short uh, in the, in that midweek. Um, then game week two, already we know um, that the Luton versus Burnley game is postponed. Now, this will not affect many people uh, because you're not planning to have many of these players anyway. But what you should know is even the imminent double game week whenever this is uh, you know rescheduled is not going to be anytime soon i mean it could be way out and this this year the premier league has actually committed that they will give fans a lot of i think it's six weeks notice before any game is rescheduled so those of you looking to captain weghorst again uh, you'll have to wait but uh, those of you who don't know it is going to be a blank because luton's stadium is not yet ready why they didn't switch their home and away ties, I don't know, but that's what it is. So Luton versus Burnley postponed game week two. Now, between game week two and game week three, uh, Villa are actually in Europe uh, because they play the first leg of their Conference League playoff, which they need to sort of get through to reach the proper Conference League. And you know how Una Emery takes, how seriously he takes European competition. So expect Villa as well to be a little bit sort of, uh, you know, worked uh, more than usual because they will play in the midweek between game week two and game week three and they will play in the game midweek between game week three and game week four because it's a two-legged um, playoff game week three midweek after game week three midweek um, is basically the Carabao Cup round two um, and the Carabao Cup round two is for all the teams who are not in Europe so apart from the eight that have qualified everybody else will have their first or round two of the Carabao Cup and then Game week four is when the first international break comes. So I'm telling you these things because they'll be important as we talk about the wildcard window. So game week four will be the first break that we will have to assess things. Uh, game week five, then after game week five is the first time 
when the Champions League starts or the Europa League starts. So that's when basically the rotation comes strong and that's something to keep in mind. Game week six is actually the Carabao Cup round three. So the teams that have qualified from round two and all the European teams will join here. This is actually a good thing because obviously the, the bigger teams rotate a lot. So actually the players are rested. So it's not a bad thing that they have this in game week six. And then, of course, after game week seven, you have Champions League again. And then after game week eight, you have the international break. So this is the first thing that we wanted to discuss today, which is, you know, the what is the... What are the things to think about in the first eight game weeks? I should have so said this at the start, but this is all from Lego Mane. I mean, you know, if you've, if you've listened to my stuff, you know how much I love what Lego Mane does. So this is another chart that Lego Mane has done. Let's go to the next one, which is basically the hop-on, hop-off chart that Lego Mane has, has done. He's been doing this uh, a long time, but this helps me particularly a lot for wildcard windows. And let me tell you why, because... As soon as you look at this, you can get some themes. So let me talk about the themes that jump out to me for these eight teams. And these eight teams are obviously, you know, the four Champions League guys, uh, plus Liverpool, plus Brighton, plus Spurs and Chelsea. So these are the teams that comprise primarily of our 15-man team or, or especially the 11. So we'll focus a little bit on them and that will determine our wildcard windows and so on and so forth. So what you see on this is for each team the the you know the the grayed out uh, fixtures are the ones that are these tougher games and of course the blanks are here reflected as as well in game week 2 and for those that don't know by the way there's a blank as well in game week 18 which is also confirmed because man city and brentford will not happen because man city will be in this um, not the super cup but the the world club cup and so that's in Saudi Arabia. So that will happen in game week 18. And so they will. that will be a blank. But anyway, first let's come to Man City. So the first thing that jumps out for Man City, if you look at this chart, is the first seven are actually really amazing, apart from Newcastle at home, which also you can argue is a home game and, and it's not a bad game anyway. They're all games, Burnley, Sheffield United, Fulham, West Ham, Nottingham Forest, Wolves, that you know you back them to win. Well, you back Man City to win anyway, but these are really, really good games. Uh, and you would actually expect, you know, three plus goals, for example. This plays into my thinking in terms of Perma captaincy, in terms of if I want any City defenders or, or even a Foden. But, you know, we're not getting into players for this uh, stream or video. Um, but, you know, Man City, that is an interesting phase. They only have three home games in the first eight, though. So even though they're good fixtures, the only games they have at home are Newcastle, Fulham and Nottingham Forest. Good ones. But still, that's the case. After game week seven, Man City have a little bit of a tougher run. Again, you, no game for Man City is tough. You know, we saw how they won their Champions League semifinals, quarterfinals, finals. It's not tough. But game week eight, they're away to Arsenal. Then they play Brighton. Then they play Man United. Then after Bournemouth, they play Chelsea, Liverpool, Spurs and Villa. So all of that is grayed out. And you can see this really nicely in this chart. But, you know, we will see what that means for our Man City assets a bit later. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's now come to Arsenal. Arsenal's run is decent throughout, but there are some tricky fixtures between game week four and game week eleven. So between in game week four they play Man United. It's a home game. Game week six they play Spurs. Game week eight they play Man City. All these three are home, so which is not a bad thing. And then they play Chelsea away in game week nine. So this little patch is then sandwiched by really good fixtures around it. So. You know, Arsenal will be in our thoughts throughout. The good thing is the first eight game weeks, they play five at home. So like I mentioned, the home games are on the tougher side, but they are at home. So you would back them to do well, apart from maybe Man City. But Spurs and Man United home, they should do well. Let's go to Man United, though. Man United are interesting because they also have five home games in the first eight. But the fi first five games themselves are not ideal. They play Spurs away. They have Arsenal away and they have Brighton at home. So you, it's difficult to predict these. But because you have five home games in the first eight, like I mentioned, Wolves at home, Nottingham Forest at home, Brighton, Crystal Palace and Brentford, they are appealing if you're looking for a slightly longer term wildcard horizon. And I will come to what that means for them. Uh, Newcastle. So Newcastle, interesting, not a lot of love in our drafts at the moment. And that's because they're beginning 
is not ideal because they play Villa, then Man City away, then they play Liverpool and they play Brighton. So, you know, all four of these games, you'd probably expect the opponents to score. Maybe the Villa home, um, you know, they could they could eke out a clean sheet. But you saw what Watkins did to them away, but still. So Newcastle first four game weeks aren't ideal. But then after that, a lot of people will want Newcastle assets, whether that's Wilson or, you know, even a Trippier. Because after that, their run is excellent. They play Brighton, Sheffield United, Burnley, West Ham, Crystal Palace, Wolves, even Arsenal and Chelsea that they have in that run, both at home, Man United at home as well. So until game week 15, actually, they're not a bad team to back. Uh, Liverpool. <coughs> Excuse me. So so with Liverpool, look, this is a hot topic. Um, they're, they should do better with a better midfield. But the fact of the matter is their start isn't the, isn't the greatest. If you look at their first eight game weeks, only three of them are at home, so five away. And in that run, they they uh, they do play. I mean, Bournemouth at home is much talked about, which is the game week two fixture. But then apart from that, you have Chelsea away, you have Newcastle away, you have Villa at home, you have Tottenham away, Brighton away, all by game week eight. So the only fixture where I think you need to hide behind a sofa, let's say if you don't have a Salah, he could do well in any game. So I want to caveat that. But, you know, we're talking a hat-trick kind of game. That's game week two against Bournemouth. You could say maybe away to Wolves in game week five. Home to West Ham, maybe. But then apart from that, those are reasonably tough games. So, and the interesting part is after game week eight, their run is amazing. And I will come to why that makes a game week eight wildcard also appealing in a second. Um, Brighton. Again, an interesting team. Many people have two or even three Brighton in their in their um, game week one team. But you have to be aware that the first three game weeks for Brighton are excellent. They're, they're the top of the ticker in the first three game weeks because they play Luton and West Ham at home and then Wolves away. But then after that, they have a run of six games, which is fairly tough, which is Newcastle, Man United away, Aston Villa away, Liverpool at home and Man City away. But again, annoyingly, in game week six, in that run, they play Bournemouth at home. So you might want to hold on to some of them or you might want to think about rotation. But, you know, it's a team that um, you might want to keep anyway. They also have five home games in the first eight. And I keep using eight as a horizon because you will see this also in my wildcard window analysis. I don't think we can look beyond eight game weeks as a fixture. Like you can't say in nine game weeks you're playing Nottingham Forest at home. So I'm going to keep that because a lot can change. So I've used eight as a barometer for that. Um, Chelsea, <clears throat> very interesting one. Uh, their first eight game weeks are excellent. Apart from Liverpool at home, which is a home game, so it's not too bad. They play West Ham, Luton at home, Nottingham Forest at home, Bournemouth away, Fulham away, Burnley away, Aston Villa at home. That is as good as it gets for the first eight game weeks. So like I said, if you can manage the first fixture, which is the Liverpool at home, I think that's a team that you should target. And interestingly, after game week eight, it's a team that you can dump because you have Arsenal at home, you have Spurs away, Man City, Newcastle away, Brighton at home, and then Man United all in the next eight game weeks. So Chelsea is a team to keep in mind, good for the first eight, terrible after that. And then lastly, Spurs, they have a mixed first seven, but they're slightly better after that. So there's no big, you know, there's no one phase where I can say that Spurs is a team that you can have and, and have great fixtures because you... You know, they start out, they have Man United at home, then they have Arsenal away, they have Liverpool at home, then they have Chelsea, Aston Villa, and then Man City, all between game week 14. So they're okay, and you could find patches to target them, but actually none in, in none of this, in terms of window analysis, I could see a place where I could say, okay, you could wildcard if Sun is really shining, uh, no pun intended, um, and uh, you, you could sort of do that just because of Spurs. But anyway... That's also um, a visual by Lego Mane, which is excellent. Um, and this sort of helps us think through where are the, the fixture runs to target. So now I'm going to talk about wildcard windows. But before I do that, I have to give a shout out to our sponsors, Fantasy Football Scout. Obviously, people know that I, I'm also a, a pro pundit at Fantasy Football Scout and I use the website a lot. Uh, I'd encourage people to get membership if they can. Um, they have a 30% off at the moment. And to be honest, my favorite feature that they have going on right now is basically a minutes tracker of every single player in preseason, who's scoring, who's assisting, how many minutes each player is getting. It's it's fabulous. So big shout out to Neil 
um, and and the team to um, for what they do here. So let's get to the wildcard windows. Um, those of you who followed me last year, I did a similar one uh, for burning questions, very similar, and you know I added this uh, this bench boost game week one wildcard game week two as as just a throwaway. But it actually was pretty popular. I saw quite a few people looking at an option like that. It's personally not for me, but for completeness, I've started out with a Game Week 1 bench boost team. Now, why would I bench boost in Game Week 1, people would ask. The one reason why you would look at a bench boost in Game Week 1 is because it's the only game week the game gives you where you can free hit or wildcard and bench boost in the same game week. Normally, if you will go out in game week 29, 34, you'll have to wildcard, see out one game week. They could be injuries, they could be whatever, and then you bench boost the next week. So you see a lot of people taking hits before bench boost because they want to get the right team. Game week one, you can basically good, take a good assessment on minutes based on preseason, fitness, and you can just put out a team, bench boost the same week. That's why people find it popular, and then it doesn't hang over your head later that you have to kind of maintain your bench or make transfers of your third bench player. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I just wanted to say that uh, some people could look at it. And I have literally put two minutes in this bench boost. So please do not, don't use it as one that I think is the best bench boost team for game week one. But just to give you an idea, you can have keepers like Pickford and Fabianski who play Bournemouth and Fulham at home. You could have a double United defense who plays Wolf, Wol Wolves at home. You could have Estupinian, uh, Mitoma, and March who play Luton at home in game week one. You have a triple Arsenal who play Nottingham Forest at home. I've got Gabriel, Saka, and Jesus here. You could have Haaland and Ake as the two guys who play Burnley away. You could have Bowen who plays Bournemouth away. Uh, and then from Man United, you've also got Rashford who, who plays Wolves at home. And then as one other attacker, uh, my cheap attacker, I've got Wissa who plays Spurs at home. So you can see here a, f a solid team of 15 players who you would have good likelihood of starting, playing, and then you basically just well cut out. So that's your first window. It's the one that I don't personally like because as, as the pricing is coming down and we know that the game is bringing down pricing for a lot of good teams, your bench boost later is a lot more attractive than it used to be. So this used to be a strategy that used to work in the past, less so now, but for completeness, I had to include it. So you uh, punters out there who like a bench boost, this is one for you. So then you could wildcard in game week two. I've not shown the fixtures beyond that because not much has changed from the analysis that I just talked about with the hop on, hop off. You know, you, you'd start out with, um, you know, some Liverpool, some Chelsea, because you've, those fixtures you've got out of the way. And then it's a more cleaner... Um, sort of path but obviously you lose out if things change you don't have a wild card and the rest too so let's go to now my first proper window which is um, game week five so <clears throat> the benefits of a game week five wild card um, and i'm you know in, in this will be a similar table so first actually let me describe what the table is this table shows you at the top game week one to four who are the top five teams in the fixture ticker. So from game week one to four, Arsenal are number one, Brentford number two, Everton, Chelsea, and then Brighton. And then the bottom five, so the worst is Newcastle, then Fulham, then Nottingham Forest, Aston Villa, and Bournemouth. So what this tells you is if you were going to pre-plan a game week five wildcard, you should be targeting Arsenal, Brentford, Chelsea, Brighton, and to an extent Everton. So let's say you could have a Pickford in goal. Um, and you would not have teams from the bottom five that I've got highlighted here. And then at the bottom there, I show you game week five to 12. Why 12? Again, that eight game week horizon. So after, when you wildcard in game week five, what are you looking at? You'll be looking at Aston Villa as the top team on the ticker, Liverpool as the number two, Newcastle as number three. So big change. If you see the template today, you don't see a lot of Liverpool and Newcastle. That's what you'd get if you wildcard in game week four. Then you have Spurs, number four, another interesting one. If you see the signs from Spurs, again, this is after the international break. So, you know, let's say if Kane leaves, you can jump on on a game week four, five wildcard and get the guys and fit the structure where maybe you can have a Rich Allison, Salah, which other people don't, and then Fulham. And at the bottom of this, you'd, you have uh, West Ham at the bottom, Sheffield United, Bournemouth, Brentford, and Burnley. So I'm not going to repeat this for every single one, but this is just to give you an explanation of what it is. And on the right of this table, you see these eight key teams that I've talked about. It gives you a ranking on the fixture ticker. 
So as you've seen, Arsenal are number one. So that's highlighted on that first column, which is pre wildcard. And you see at the bottom, Newcastle is 20 uh, pre wildcard, and Newcastle become number three. So this already shows you a little bit of a fixture swing. So you see that Liverpool have gone from the 12th best on the fixture ticket to the second. So that's a good fixture swing that you can see at the bottom of the table. Then you see Newcastle, mine, you know, 20th to third, and Aston Villa. Uh, and then on the bad side, so bad basically means that you want to get out of these teams. You, you you get on them before wildcard and you get out after wildcard. So Chelsea and Brighton basically fix, fi fit that bill. Brighton being fifth on the ticket and then 15th after wildcard. In terms of pros and cons, uh, like I said, it's after the international break. You will be swimming in uh, in money in this wildcard because uh, there are prices are most volatile in the first four or five game weeks because people, you know, the the whole 11, 12 million, whoever sign up, will be playing the game by then. So they don't care about news, about press conferences. They will be making transfers. So if you're on a wild card, you could benefit in terms of prices. Now, it's not about team value, but I had to highlight one of the advantages. Um, it's just after the transfer window, like I mentioned. You can get a nice swing to get Liverpool and Newcastle. You can also avoid the two Man United, you know, they, they play uh, the two away games against Spurs and Arsenal. You can avoid them, so you don't have to triple up on Man United if you were planning a game week four wildcard. And maybe another benefit is by game week four, you, you by game week five, you might also know if the Luton-Burnley game is being rescheduled anytime soon. So, you know, you'd have the advantage of getting Veg Horse before anyone else. Um, the cons, why I don't like it is basically not enough information. Uh, you know, by game week four, you don't really know are Chelsea a legit outfit uh, because they might have signed players just before that? How are Spurs going to cope, you know, with or without Kane and so on and so forth. So game week four, game weeks is a little bit early in terms of information, in terms of data. So that's something to be wary of. And, uh, and that's about it. So that's game week five wildcard. Let's go to the one which is usually the most popular, which is game week nine wildcard. Now, Every year I get annoyed where Game Week 9 wildcard has a good fixture swing because I look at Game Week 9 as a lazy wildcard because it's a lazy wildcard because a lot of people tend to think because of the past that, oh, I wildcard in Game Week eight, 9 because it's after the second international break. We would have had eight Game Weeks of data. All of that is true. But if the fixtures are not sort of turning at the right time, I have personally been of the opinion you can also do it in 7 or 9. It doesn't have to be 8. Eight used to be common because it, during the international break, you used to get a lot of price rises. You could actually farm value. That's not happened in the last four to five years. So just have it being an international break and just it being eight game weeks of data for me isn't enough. But I'm going to make a case why actually game week eight or game week nine wildcard this year is a decent shout. So talking about the table, you could target Chelsea, who are top of the ticker from one to eight, which you saw in my hop off, hop on, hop off discussion. You could target Arsenal, Man City, which are good teams, so w worth targeting them anyway. And then at the bottom, it's Newcastle, Bournemouth, West Ham, Wolves, and Forest. You basically not have any Newcastle or, you know, don't overcommit to Newcastle. And then coming out of this wildcard from game week nine, 9 to 16, Liverpool go top. So that's the beauty of this wildcard where you can say Liverpool now are at the top of the fixture ticker. I've seen them through this really tricky run, which I talked about. And now, embarking upon after game week uh, nine onwards, Liverpool will play Everton at home, Nottingham Forest, Luton, Brentford. Yes, they have a tough one against Man City. But then again, Fulham, Sheffield United and Crystal Palace. Absolutely insane. So that's the time that you've sort of evaluated who are the Liverpool guys to target. Is Diaz an option? Is Darwin Nunes an option? Or do I have to go Salah? Is Trent important for 8 million or not? So I think that eight game week eight... Uh, information and then wildcarding in game week nine during the international break is going to be very popular. It's not my favorite one yet. I will talk about my favorite one uh, later. But uh, the Chelsea swing again. If you're if you're looking for a game week eight wildcard, you know, have a wing back, have a full back, have a Chilwell, uh, if you, or if James is fit, maybe even punt on a Sterling because Chelsea are really good for the first eight game weeks, and then you don't need to bother. Um, and then Palace and West Ham actually are also teams to target in a game week nine wildcard. They've got good fixtures. And those are two teams specifically I've singled out because they have these talisman and Bowen and maybe an Eze that other people may not. So if they're holding off on a wildcard or they've wildcarded early, that could be your little bit of a difference. 
some of the cons are actually Brighton have a really tricky run uh, just after game week eight. So game week nine, they play Liverpool and, um, and game week 10, they play Man City. So you'll be sort of stuck. Do I need to, do I have to have a Mitoma or do I have to have an Estupinian or even a goalkeeper if it emerges? And you'll be stuck because after that, they have a really good run. So this is why the next window, which I'll talk about, will be this game week 11 wildcard where you can actually get a more comfortable uh, team, which includes Brighton. But anyway, I, I won't come to 11 yet. And Man City also actually don't have the best run after game week um, 9. Now, obviously, Man City are great and Haaland is great. It's not like you're not going to have them. But, you know, just bear in mind... You know, looking at Lego Man is uh, hop on hop off again. Arsenal away, Brighton, Man United, Chelsea, Liverpool, Spurs, and Villa, all in the next eight game weeks. That's not going to be easy. So maybe you know, just Haaland could be enough. Uh, and then of course they have the blank in game week eighteen. So Man City are slightly tricky, and they will sort of pose us some dilemmas when we get to that. Um, that is game week nine. <clears throat> Let's go to game week 11. So this one is pretty similar to game week 9, except this solves the Brighton issue that I had talked about. So as, as soon as you come out of this, Brighton are fourth in the fixture ticker, whereas in the earlier one, they were actually right, you know, closer to the bottom. So if you were looking at this strategy, you know, you could still target a Chelsea, Spurs, Arsenal, Brentford, and you would st sort of stay away from a Brighton as because it's a 10 game week horizon, you would stay away from Brighton initially, but then after that, you would target Brighton a lot more. What are the things about game week 10, wild, uh, 11 wildcard? <clears throat> it's a better horizon to target Spurs. So Spurs' fixtures, as I said, in the early part aren't, aren't the best, but actually in that period until game week 10 is pretty good. Chelsea, Liverpool, I've talked about. One other thing here is you could actually get Salah. Um, so City play Man United. In, in game week 10. And so if you were going to wildcard in game week 11, you could maybe get, uh, you know, if you don't want to captain Haaland against Man United away. Now, it's uh, it's not uh, Haaland at home. So I know people are thinking about game week 9 last year. But this is the, the game in which he blanked, which is at Old Trafford. If you didn't want to back uh, Haaland, you could get Salah captain in game week 10, potentially. And... Um, you know, you, you would fund him by selling your Rashford and your Brunos and you get Salah and captain him, game week 10 against Nottingham Forest, and then you wildcard into a structure which you which you better want. So this one has a little bit of a dead-end potential, um, which game week 9 didn't have. Actually, game week 9, one thing I did not talk about is in game week 9 wildcard, you could dead-end Arsenal assets because Arsenal play Man City in game week 8. So if you're if you're playing a game week nine wildcard, so I'm going back to the previous one, then one big advantage of that is you can basically exit your Arsenal players just for that one week when they play uh, Man City. And you could basically get somebody from a Crystal Palace who plays in Nottingham Forest, or you could get somebody from Spurs who play Luton. So basically a Saka to a Madison just before a wildcard. So that was one big advantage of game week nine, uh, nine wildcard. Game week 11, as I mentioned, you could get on Salah if you aren't already just for that NFO fixture. Um, let's go to then game week 16. So before I talk about game week 16, one thing to mention is if you look at Lego Mane's uh, matrix, there is a period between game week 10 and game week 14, which is slightly uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because <clears throat> in that same period, Liverpool play City, Arsenal play Newcastle, Man United play Newcastle, and Chelsea play Brighton. So it's not an ideal time to sort of be loaded up on these teams when the, the, the fixtures are a little bit difficult to call. So what <clears throat> Game Week 16 does, it basically helps you come out of that tricky, messy period. And it basically targets, again, the teams that, have good that are good teams with good fixtures. So look at this in terms of game week uh, 16 onwards. The teams that have the best fixtures are Chelsea, Brighton, Man City, Man United. Those are the better teams. Now, obviously, Arsenal, you could still back. Um, but that sort of gives you a list of teams that you would want to have anyway. And Liverpool, interestingly, after game week 16, become bottom of the ticker. So again, it will make it slightly easier for you as you look to 
get out of Salah, Trent, and Salah will be also important because Salah is actually off to AFCON. And this year we also will have a, um, you know, game week 21 to 24 is when, when Salah will be off. So maybe that's a period where you say, I'm not going to have Salah, even if he's showing some form because they're, they don't have the best fixture run. So I like game week 16 actually, because um, you will again target the best teams and you will uh, you will be it'll be easier to navigate or sell players through these trickier fixtures that happen between game week 10 and 14 that I talked about obviously the big con for this is it's getting very late right i mean if you're in game week 16 and you haven't wild carded you've missed out on a lot of price rises bandwagons and so it's not the best thing um if you wanted to if you are one of those team value aficionados but Patience can pay off, and patience will pay off if you waited till game week 19. This is my final game week window that I wanted to talk about, and the reason is the Man City blank. Uh, the Man City blank and the fact that the best teams have the best fixtures coming out of game week 19. Game week 19 is the last game week where you can play a wild card, and so what you would basically do here is you would sell Haaland and any other City assets by a blank game week 18, uh, you can even drop some Arsenal um, and and maybe a Trent because actually Arsenal play Liverpool in game week 18. So that's basically what you'll be solving. You have a blank game week for City. You have Liverpool playing Arsenal. You dead end these guys if you can. You get Newcastle who play Luton. You get Spurs who play Everton. You know, for example, I can predict now that Haaland to Kane captain will be very, very popular in game week 18 uh, to get that captaincy. So you can sort of not have to worry about that and you can just wildcard Holland and others back in game week 19. So that's one thing that I think um, will, will, will be important. And then the most important thing, after game week 19, top of the ticker, Brighton, then Man United, then Man City, then Villa, then you know, you've got Arsenal and Liverpool in the top 10 as well. So again, back to really good teams having superb fixtures, which you can then have for the long term. So you're basically set until your second wild card. So for me, at the moment, this this makes me think that I'm going to target a long term wild card. I'm not going to plan for a game week eight, nine wild card. Now, a lot of people play differently, right? And a lot of people say, I don't plan for any wild card. If I need it, I'll use it. And that's absolutely fine. I tend to play in a way where I have an anchor, where I think that I... So for example, if somebody is targeting a game week nine wild card, Get Chelsea fullbacks. Don't get Salah and Trent because you will be able to get them later. Now, of course, there could be other reasons you want them. But if you're looking at it purely from a fixture perspective, those are reasons that push you towards one versus the other. Um, <clears throat> and that's that's really it. That's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, oh, yeah. The other thing is when you wildcard out of this uh, and when you're wildcarding in gimmick 19, another obviously the pro is that Salah will be in AFCON, so you don't have to worry about Salah. So you can, again, build a Haaland only or a Haaland and Trent team. And all is great. So um, that's all from me. I have uh, gone on for quite a while. It's my first solo video, and it's 33 minutes, so you've heard enough from me. Um, good luck, and uh, I will be back uh, with the guys, obviously, in the main podcast. But uh, hopefully this separate video on fixtures and, and on wildcard windows is helpful. Like I said at the beginning of the pod, um, we're really targeting 30,000 subs by game week one. So if you like the video, obviously like it, um, but also please consider subscribing, consider joining our Patreon um, and our Discord channel, which is absolutely fantastic. A lot of people are giving really good views about what they're seeing in preseason. So it's the time to join if you can. Thank you very much and see you all soon.